Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to this New Zealand Festival Writers' Week inaugural session with Anna Smale. I'm Kate de Goldie, the chair for this session, and it's my great pleasure to be talking to Anna. She is, of course, the author of The Chimes and a, an earlier beautiful volume of poetry called The Violinist in Spring. And as it happens, today is the 172nd birthday of the great violinist Sarasate. So I thought that was really appropriate. Heard that on um, concert program this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Just be before we start, um, can you all please check that your phones are on silent? And I need to give some thanks on behalf of the New Zealand Festival. We'd like to thank the Lion Foundation, Victoria University of Wellington, Creative New Zealand, QT Museum Wellington, Unity Books, and the New Zealand Book Council for their support of this session in particular. Anna and I are going to talk for a while. She's going to read from the chimes, and there'll be time for you to ask questions. So as we're talking, please do think of questions you'd like to ask her near the end of the session. Anna. Kate, happy <laughs> to be here. Thank you for coming. It's good to have you. Um, <laughs> you're going to do a reading from the chimes. It's a marvellous... Um, immersive and complex book. So I think the best thing to do to start off with mm. is to explain to the audience perhaps the origins of the novel sure. and, and the concept, because it's quite yeah. a high concept novel. I feel like I've messed up my mic already. Sorry, Mo. Um, <clears throat> Can you all hear her? Is that okay? Excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so the book, it had quite a long genesis. Um, I was living in London and... Um, I had started off doing my PhD in London, and then I'd finished it, and was in that sort of interim state of vocational kind of existential crisis that occurs when you sort of finish a big project. Who am I? What Who am I? Am I what do? am I doing? Yeah. Will I ever make any money out of you know? <laughs> Especially now that I've just done a PhD done in a PhD. North American poetry. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, completely irrelevant to most yeah. sort of major life topics. Um, so I had um, I was working in a series of sort of pretty dead end jobs, to be frank. Um, but I'd had this idea that, um, sort of earlier actually, while I was finishing my PhD, of writing a novel. And I, you know, I think I'd always felt about novel writing as I feel about you know, people who run, as something that other people do, um, something that I would never do. Um, and I, so I had sort of started it almost sort of tentatively to myself even. I hadn't quite acknowledged that this was going to be a novel. Um, and, but it was, very, it was very kind of earnest and plodding. It was very much a kind of a... Um, Re not realist, but it was a sort of a third-person past tense uh, book ab about a, a world in which music was dominant. But it was kind of an institutional novel, like in the sense of a Harry Potter or something where you've got a, a, a sort of a, a school or an uh, elite structure. Um, a place. And, a place, yeah. yeah. And, then and an a, authority. And somebody within mm. that place actually kind of growing up in there. Um, and this, it just didn't take off. I was writing it, and I was kind of interested in it, but it just was sort of quite flat on the page. And then um, I've told this story a few times, um, and it sounds quite cheesy to me, but I just had this moment where I was, I'd finished, I'd quit the, a job, and I was, you know, in this state of what am I doing? And I was actually literally on the bus in London, um, a very big busser in London. I love the London buses. I never really liked going into the underground as much. And um, I actually heard the voice, this voice kind of sort of came out of nowhere, and it really sort of... Um, you know, it really just hit me, and I like, had my notebook, and so I actually wrote some of it down. And the voice was, you know, I, even though it was, it was sort of mysterious to me, I could sort of tell a few things about it, and that was that it was speaking from a place that was dark, that was limited, and that was dangerous um, in, in many ways. And in some ways, there were some major sort of forms of oppression on that voice. But yet it was speaking in a way that was, that you wouldn't expect. It was speaking in a way that was sort of hopeful and full of love. Um, and I um, was kind of entranced by this, and, but it took me two or three days, I think, um, until I actually had this kind of epiphany moment where I, said, where I realized that the origins of that world that I was talking about, the one in an, ruled by music, and that this voice could actually be part of the same world. And so in that moment of sort of suspension and could it work, that is sort of where the book mm. sprung up. It's kind of perfect that it came to you through sound, isn't it, given that the whole thing is just um, threaded through with music as a metaphor, music as an organising principle, music as a weapon. Yeah, it's interesting. And you just, it just really did feel like I could hear the rhythms of that voice. Mm. And that was Simon's voice, who's the protagonist of the novel. 
Um, so I should, I should give you a little bit of background about the book if you haven't read it, trying to avoid spoilers for those who haven't. Um, but it's essentially it's set in a future London, um, which probably feels a bit more like a medieval London. Mm. It's sort of a pre-modern as well as a post-apocalyptic world. Um, and it's a world that's ruled by music. Um, it's ruled by a sort of dominant faction who are an elite, uh, who are who believe in music as a kind of a, a philosophy and as a method of intellectual um, training. And as so th and they basically the function through which they rule is this sort of immense instrument called the carry-on. And that sort of disseminates um, music throughout the populace of England uh, two times a day. And it's a very kind of physically controlling uh, experience, but it also has this physiological um, subterranean effect on the nervous system and on the brain, which is that it, it destroys memory. So it's a um, mm. slightly sort of strange, high concept um, world, um, but it, it was, yeah. It was it's, it's a marvelous and really <coughs> distressing concept. And I, I want to ask you first, sure. um, so much to talk about there. <laughs> um, you are a trained violinist, a classically yes. trained violinist. You worked immensely hard for many years, yes, yeah. until you were about 20, two, three? Um, till I was about 19, actually. Right, okay. Yeah, I was quite young, yeah. Um, and you went to university and yeah. studied the violin. So music made you, in many respects. Utterly, yes. But in this book, music that I think of as um, an entirely benign affair yeah, yeah. is being wielded as a weapon. And I know because you've talked a little bit about it to me, that music had um, a kind of binary effect for you when you were studying it. It, it wasn't a simple, straightforward affair. No. And so this I, partly comes out of that, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, entirely. Um, and it's very strange because I loved music and I, I sort of, it was self-directed. My parents weren't sort of the tiger parents sort of instructed me to practice, well, mm. and probably a little bit, but um, I, I was very much drawn to it. And, um, but I think always my experience of playing the violin was utterly binary in the sense that I had this understanding of what I wanted to sound like and then the reality, the physical reality of like, what I did sound like, um, which at first is just everyone's experience of playing an instrument. Everyone, I'm sure lots of people here have had this experience and you, you know, especially with a violin, which exactly. really <laughs> sounds horrendous if you can't play it. Um, you know, and I, I, you, you, I improved and I, and I got, I fell in love with the noises that I could mm. make, mm. but I think there was always this disjunction between what I wanted to express and my physical mm. capability of, of, of expression. So in a way you could say music was like the order, it was a really hard taskmaster. Utterly, yes, yeah. yeah um, the order being the elite body who uh, rule England. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, and I think the kind of, um, that sort of, the binary that it tended to enforce on me, which was that, you know, you work towards a kind of a perfection of expression, but that in some way, that's up here, it's mental, mm. and that you've got to sort of make your body go through a series of functions. You've got to sort of treat your body almost as if a, as a, you know, a machine yes. in order to kind of purify it or kind of you know, sort of um, you know, make it work ideally so that you can serve this higher mm. transcendent function of, of spirit or expression. So literally your body and your mind are the servant of music. A little, yeah, or the, very much that the body was at the, serv mm. at the sort of servitude of what was happening in the, in in the, the brain, mind, right. yeah. Which is, I think, a completely false binary, I think, you know, and it has to fall apart because, mm. of course, what your body does is, is mm. your emotions are your body and vice versa. Mm. It's, not, it's not, you know, this, this mm. dualist understanding. It's, yeah. But that experience has been awfully useful for the chimes because um, in, in here mm. the characters experience music physically, um, their bodies are totally affected by it, they're directed by it, it's a navigational tool, yes. it's a tool yeah. as well as a weapon, it gives pleasure but it basically enslaves them. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. I wanted to show that it was this wonderful and kind of fertile force, but at the same time it had, if taken to its extremes, had, I guess, a dark mm. and malignant power. Um, and I guess, yeah, that is entirely <laughs> autobiographical. Mm. But I really did want to convey a world in which music was all-encompassing and the, um, the navigation, the communication. Because um, music, yeah. has, music has provided um, a new gloss on language. I mean, 
music and language in the novel are completely sort of fused. Mm. So you have a new vocabulary in here, which you very skillfully wield so that we always understand what people are saying. But can, can you tell everyone about Soulfish? How did, how did one say that? Soulfish, yeah, that's, Soulfish. that's how I always heard yeah. it. Um, well, so in, in the book, I was, I was intent on this idea that music will have replaced the written word and be used as a form of communication. And it's, um, it's, not an un, it's not an unheard of concept. People have actually created musical languages. I think there are two, two or three even extant musical languages where people have tried to um, work out how you could potentially communicate in, in music. Um, and my basic idea, I sort of I glossed over a little bit of the practicalities of it. <laughs> as one um, must. As one <laughs> must. Um, so it's more of a sort of metaphorical kind of, uh, sort of, or poetic kind of, a basis for this, but um, it was that you essentially, it was sort of saying that there was a similarity between Solfege, and I don't know if everyone knows, Solfege is, a, is an actual system that was developed to use hand signals to tie in with the notes of the scale, and um, if anyone's seen The Sound of Music, that's, that's what they're doing with their hands, so it's, you know, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, so. It's at the front of the book, and a helpful diagram. Yeah, and the idea is that it's transferable, so even if a piece of music modulates, you can still use those signals, and then you can mm. um, basically convey what the piece of music is. So my idea of that was that in some way it's, it's sort of relate, it's sort of almost like a form of sign language, and that therefore you can use it, but you can, that means you can communicate. Mm. Um, so there's not a huge amount of practical uh, no foundation for that, um, because I think, you know, no one's going to use musical languages, essentially, I think th the people who have created them mm. might have one or two people they can sort of mm. say a few sentences to, but... Well, and the people who have created them, be be they hold on to the knowledge by being about the only two people who can yeah, use it Yeah, it's like anyway. Esperanto or something, yeah. yeah. But the navigation was a little bit different, I, I sort of, I like to, like to think that there was some kind of physiological basis in that, and I think mm. it's, it's all down to... An experience I had when I was trained as a violinist, um, you had to do theory, of course, and musicology and other elements of, um, of music. And this was in Canter at Canterbury University. And one of my um, lecturers was a guy who had this very idiosyncratic theory called body tonics. Mm -hmm. And his idea was that you should be able to, as just as solfege kind of reinforces a physiological connection between what you're doing, your movements, and the the sounds, this idea that you should be able to do it with your whole body, mm. and that in some way the physical movements would also capture some element of the, um, the, mu the physiological elements of music. So, you know, if you've got a chord progression that shows some kind of tension, the, the, move, the body movement would also reflect that tension. You know, maybe balancing on one leg is a kind of precarious position, and then you come back to a a solid, you know, grounded Which we might tonic. call the tonic key. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so he used to get us all standing up and we'd, he had these movements you'd go through for like each chord progression and we'd all be standing up doing this kind of slightly odd sort of <laughs> tai chi almost to, and no one, no one could do it. <laughs> you know, it was very much his baby and, and mm. he, um, but I was intrigued by it and mm. I think it must have obviously lodged in my brain as an interesting idea even if it's, you know, Conceptually, Barking. rather than yeah, completely mad. <laughs> <laughs> and so your characters are able to navigate, and, and we'll talk about the under in a second. Mm. Navigate the under of London, the underground, yeah. by way of music. Exactly. It's, it's the tool for navigation through their bodies. Yeah, and it was a little bit, I guess, influenced by um, reading Bruce Chapman's song, the song right, lines, right, um, yeah. which I read probably not particularly well as a teenager. Sort of possibly didn't fully grasp some of the concepts, and I don't fully know. If Chatwin actually fully mm. grasped some of the concepts, but um, where he's is, talking about Aboriginal, he's talking about Aboriginal song lines, mm. which is this, this idea that you almost you sing the landscape into mm. creation, or that no, sorry, that the landscape was sung into creation by mm. the sort of the sort of you know the the kind of first beings, and then in order to navigate it, you had to go back and sing that, learn the learn, learn the landscape, yeah, yeah, and that you're constantly kind of revisiting and um, refreshing mm. those those melodic markers, mm. which then tell you, also sort of reveal and, and tell you about the landscape. The parts set in the under where they're nav navigating in this way are quite mesmerising. <laughs> um, they're in the first part of the novel, and we'll talk a little bit later about the tricks in the first part mm -hmm. of the novel, but can you read an extract from yeah. them in the under? So sure. Simon has joined a group called Pack Runners. Pack Runners, yeah, so there's pacts, yeah. Pacts yeah. of kids, really, or young people. Yeah, essentially. Because, ju just before you do that, mm. Anna, explain that there's, a s there's hierarchies. There's um, 
apprentices. Just right. yeah. tell everyone what that is. Well, I mean, it's all basically, so it's organised around this idea that you are going to lose your memory. Um, you can retain a certain amount of short-term memory, but um, to do that, you've basically got to kind of reinforce it in your body, so you have this body memory, which is sort of this idea that, you know, the physical stuff we do every day in some way enables us to remember mm. who we are. Um, and so there are different, it's tr very much a sort of a pre-modern medieval kind of set sense where you've got trades, you've got guilds, um, and so you have to start young as a pr an apprentice in order to kind of cement the memory of these, of mm. these trades. Um, but pets who are sort of orphans, basically, like street the, kids, like street they? kids, yeah, yeah, on the outskirts of society. And what they do is essentially they're running through the under, as, as Kate said, which is a series of tunnel networks, which d does exist under London, um, in a, a the sort of envision of post-apocalyptic London. So there's obviously you no know, tubes running. So it's the um, it's the underground lines. It's the it's the old tunnels that would have been there for stormwater and for um, you know there's there's a whole network. So anyway, they're running through there, and the idea is that they're kind of um, they're prospecting for a, a kind of metal, so that's their apprenticeship, is, is knowing right. the under. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a whole um, black market, really, isn't there, yes, in yeah. the sale of this metal, and the metal is called lady. Well, it's, it's palladium. Palladium, yes, yeah, um, but that is only revealed a little bit later. Yes. First of all, that you know that they're looking for something called capital L, lady. The lady, yeah. It's sinister in the extreme, because you <laughs> yeah. don't know what it is, except something like silver. Yeah, well, it was the pale or the pale lady, and it's yeah. from, yeah, palladium, so the pale mm. lady. But it's also, of course, um, a Pallas lot of Athene, who's, yes. you know, the pale lady as well. There's a lot of word trickery in this book. <laughs> but anyway, in the under. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully it will make a little sense. If not, then don't worry, you're not alone. Um, <laughs> Lucian hums a low note again. It's the tonic, the home key. We sing it back to him as a chord, first major, then minor. Our hearing's keener now, and our singing sets up a low thrum in the amphitheatre that dies lento. First, as always, he sings the haunted, silvery tune that is the lady's song, to remind us of why we're down here, what we're searching for. The silver flashes for me as he sings it, almost as if it could light up the dark. Then he sings our bearings in his reeded voice, he starts with the melody of where we are, this dark room under the city, and from there his voice moves through several keys until he sings the exact shape of the river, the part that is our territory. This is for his benefit, not ours. Lucian is the only one of us who can hold the whole map in his head at once. After he has his bearings, he sings us the tune of where we will run and where we will find the lady. Standing still in the darkness, I follow Lucian's melody as far as I can as he sings. Standing still with my imagination running onward, to get to the curve of tune that tells of the Limehouse caisson, he has moved back round to the fourth chord, setting that as the tonic, by gesturing across the circle to the wistful pulling tone of the flattened seventh. He sings the banks of the Thames from Wapping to Millwall. My body moves with it so I feel the weight of each chord in the muscle. How to explain? The tonic, steady, stable, like standing upright on solid ground looking forward, that's your north. The fifth chord is that moment just on the edge of a new balance, one foot and one arm aloft, almost ready to swing round and upward to the new scale, north to east, and with each modulation, so on. I listen hard, feel the shifts in my body and in our planned direction, feel the melody swing me, modulate. He sketches our direction onward and outward in the pattern of notes and cadences we will follow under the river. After a while, my memory falters and I'm back to standing where I was all along, in the main amphitheatre with the network of tunnels spreading out their mystery around listening blind for the tune that will be our thread through the dark. At last, the melody comes to its end, and we stand and smell the tunnel's cool breath, waiting for the sounding to settle in our minds. Then the run begins. The run is hard, the way is hard at first, because the tunnel is narrow and low. I run with Claire. Our hearing fits well. She has a good recall for rhythm, which means she can keep the distances in mind. We're in water halfway up our shins, and there's the shock of the cold as it makes its way through my overshoes. Then it warms and the warmth is trapped in the layer of wool and leather and we settle into a good half jog. The tunnel is as Lucian sung it and the tune keeps us following straight for a good while until the first cadence comes upon us and we follow the tune he gave us, sharp west. There are no steps upward to the mouth of the new tunnel and I had to pull myself up first and then turn to give Claire an arm up. This is wide and dry with a bricky, sandy smell. We take the twists and turns that the tune tells us, and before long we're running straight again, and then we're just waiting for the first tunnel that will lead us toward the fourth chord. 
We're close to the surface, and every few beats, there's a small crack of light above us. Not sunlight, but a softer, grainier darkness. We're running now, and past a knot of openings to the east, Claire starts counting out the beats that give us the exact distance. Eight, two, three, four. Seven, two, three, four. Six, two, three, four. And so on, hearing the tune underneath. Right on time, the next cadence appears as Lucian sang it, and I see the right-hand tunnel that will lead us northeast, <clears throat> right onto the spot that Lucian sounded. Claire is a few paces ahead and gestures to me as I join her, so I drop to a walk and stand close. We both wait for our hearts to stop thudding so we can listen and see if we've dropped down on the right tunnel. Ragged breath in the still close air and the scritching sound of the feet of small creatures, mice or rats scurrying in the sandy tunnel. I stand and wait. My breath slows, then a long silver blink, a pale ellipsis of silence. Hush, it whispers, like a pulled back tide. I feel my thumbs prick, and I can hear Claire's slow smile in the darkness. I imagine the sharp white of her teeth. It's clean and close, she whispers, and I nod. She speaks from a distance, though, like her mind is clouded with some worry. We can hear her now, but it's needful to keep the tune still. Follow the lady and lose the tune, and though you'll have her, she'll not show you the way back. They say there are patch runners who have died down here, lost forever in the tunnels. I lead now, and the lady's call gets stronger. The tunnel narrows again and curves downward. It rejoins the flood wash of another drain. There's a grill to the outside that drops stripes of early morning light onto the small rush of waters. I hold my breath and go to a crouch and use both hands to sluice through the debris at the grate below. Leaves and old stick wrap bags, wads of old wet paper money. Then I lift my hands and hold them out, and Claire's breath makes a small wondering, ha, ah, in the silence. On my palm is a nugget of pale, about three ounces, and shined with soapy idle gleam in the thin light, as beautiful as anything I've ever seen. It pulses with silence. With a brisk few steps, Claire's next to me, and we look at it closer, and I give her shoulder a squeeze in gratitude for her hearing and the glow of her triumph. I slip the lady into my back jeans pocket and grin. Not bad for a morning's work, I say. Nice. Now, this is a dystopian novel, yes. and we're living yep. in the great <coughs> age of dystopian novels for teenagers. We seem to be, yes. I blame Philip Pullman. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, seriously, yep. he was the um, progenitor of the modern dystopian novel, yeah, I think. I think and we, you're right. we have Maze Runner and Hunger Games and Divergence yeah. and many, many others. But it seems to me your novel draws on an older tradition of literature, children's literature, yes. the great children's literature of the post-war period. And in particular, because you told me, I know yes. this, yeah. and then I realised all the connections later, a writer called Rosemary Sutcliffe, yeah. and in particular, again, one of her books, Simon, mm. And your Simon is kind of an homage to that Simon. Yes. A book set in the Civil War in England. So it seems to me that setting your book in England is in part because of that influence. Absolutely, yeah. And the relationship Simon has with Lucien, the whole business of friendship mm. and forging who you are against a great cataclysm like yes. a war is very much at the back of this. Yeah, and Do you I want to talk about Rosemary Sutcliffe? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so Rosemary Sutcliffe, if you haven't read her, is just the most amazing children's writer. And um, Can we just clarify children's here? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Just so that yeah. you, um, teenagers in the audience don't think, I mustn't read her. In fact, she's... She, she's a writer for everyone, I yeah. think. Um, you know, I read her first as a, as a child, you know, as, as a primary school student, mm. because I was read it by my parents, but utterly, you know, read throughout... Mm. Um, teenage years, still read now as an adult. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, I think there's something, there's something really elemental about her writing. There's this sort of, the rhythms are very deep. She goes back to myth. She goes back to sort of the earth stories. And it feels like she accesses them in a, in a way that she sort of is very essential and very kind of, mm. yeah, elemental, I think. That, 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 I mean, she's a cracking good storyteller. Yeah, That's absolutely. the first thing to say. Yes, yeah. She wields language beautifully. Yeah. But you're right. She's she's kind of retelling all the old stories in yes. her own way. Yeah. The stories that made Western civilization and the stories that made England. Exactly. And I think you know, as a child, these were some of the first books that I had I was exposed to because my parents read them to me, and yeah, you instantly you're transported to a totally different landscape. So very much you know the England of my you know. Mm. Was my sense of England was through that first apprehension. It's, 
storyland. Yeah, it's where yeah. story has to happen. And it's, it's sort of it's myth and it's sort of the dark, the sort of the wildness of it. I think is really what captured me. But I think what it's very interesting because I think um, the great literature of of childhood of, of 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 you know we've only really started calling it young adult literature, but it does in some way always thrust these individuals into their own, onto their own resources. And I think, you know, as you're saying about Sutcliffe, they're often about young people in an alien environment, in a, in a post-apocalyptic environment, frankly, because, mm. you know, this is after sort of, um, you know, after civil wars or during civil wars, a world in which everything they know has, has completely been destroyed. And so it's, it's children within an adult world, mm. often, and, and sort of trying to navigate um, trying to sort of live on their wits, trying to build emotional meaning and um, an understanding of life in that mm. sort of destroyed environment. But as you say, it's very much it's about um, love. It's mm. about it's about f friendship and love and about the sort of choices you make within that environment. And it's a strange kind of freedom. And I think a lot of the, st the books that most stuck with me as a young reader or as a young listener, because that was how I sort of first approached mm. them, um, are very much that, that trope of, you know, one of the other books which I loved as a kid was The Silver Sword. And again, it's about, you know, sort of the Nazi, Nazi oh, it's Warsaw, it's in, mm. it's in Poland. Um, and during the Second World War. During the Second World War. And their parents have, have been taken mm. to camps. And, and that's often important. Parents and family have been removed. Yep. So children need to... Help each other. Help each other mm. and rely on themselves mm. and use their own sort of, yeah, their skills, their wit, their, their, their emotional truths mm. in a way. Um, and, you know, and that followed right through in terms of, you know, I loved um, Cynthia Voigt and, the, you know, Di yeah, Homecoming, Sun, yeah. you know, when, again, they've been abandoned, they're very much have on their force, on their own resources. And it's, it's what, you know, the young adult literature does as well. So post-apocalyptic literature is very much about young people in a, in a world destroyed by adults, who mm. then have to, in some way, rebuild it. And I think um, there's something incredibly liberating to read that, mm. um, because you know how powerful you know your own feelings are at that age, and mm. how um, how I think it's a reflection, in some ways. I think for me, anyway, of what's happening anyway, which is that you're basically leaving the adult world and you're moving into a world in which you have to make all the decisions. And for me. Um, the Chimes is a lot to do with the experience of leaving home for mm. the first time. Mm. You know, Simon leaves his parents in, who have died in Essex and he goes to London and he has to take with him sort of, he, you, lo you leave, leave a family home and a family home has got all those structures of memory and objects, and of objects um, identity because you don't have to sort of reinforce your identity constantly because it's there, it's in the walls, it's in your photos on the wall, it's in your belongings. Mm. But the first time you leave home, you know, which I did when I was 16, 17, um, to go to a different country, you've got your suitcase and that's it, you know, and then you've got memories of who you are and that's who, what tells you who you are. And that's, w and that's why the removal or the suppression mm. of memory is the single most malign act that yeah. can occur to a young person because they simply don't have a basis from which to make themselves. Exactly. You can eradicate someone's past mm. entirely and their identity entirely. Mm. And I think I've always been really terrified of that because mm. I think as a young person, you, you're living far more on the edge of that realisation. Mm. That's, there's that constant awareness. You maybe haven't had a chance to kind of build the, mem the memorials, the physical memorials that adults have in terms mm. of, you know, the f sort of physical ramifications of, of your life. Um, house. You know, house. Car. Uh, car. Yeah. Um, clothes. Clothes, everything, all mm. of that structure, it's far more frangible and, mm. and sort of, um, yeah, up for grabs, mm. essentially. It's lovely to hear someone um, talk about great children's literature, literature having sort of formed them yeah. in that way. Well, it does. I mean, you know, as a writer, you often get asked, you know, what, who you're, what influences do you have and who are the writers who have really shaped who you are? And, of course, I do, you know, there's always that sort of moment of, you know, everything disappears, you know, like, um, um, you know, you can never think at that moment. But really, you know, to, if I'm being honest, the, the writers who shaped me most are the writers mm. that I read as a child or was read as a child. Mm. And it frankly comes down, you know, Sutcliffe, mm. Ian Sorellier, um, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, mm. there's sort of, and it's, I think there's something about the freedom of those books that, um, 
you can imagine the world, you can, mm. you can enter it, but anything is, is sort of potential there. Yeah. Um, mm. But I think, again, it comes down to that, the danger of those worlds, mm. the sense that anything is possibly potential, but it's reliant on, on you or the protagonist, I should say. You always identify directly with the protagonist. And to a certain degree, even though in this book, say, and in all these books you're mm. talking about, there's a massive order yes. um, that is um, shaping and restricting their lives. Mm. The great triumph of the story, I don't want to give away the end, well, the triumph is that they are trying to get agency back themselves, Lucian and Simon, and it's their friendship mm. and love of each other that helps it to happen. It's yeah. Much different as much as anything. I think, I think so, and it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the classic trope of, of quest narrative, is mm. the sort of the small individual against the big mm. oppressive regime or the big oppressive force. Um, so in a way, I think I almost, it, that's a difficult thing to shuck off. I think mm. once you enter into that plot engine, mm. you almost, you have to sort of, just sort of humbly sort of submit to it almost. I mean, I sort of tried to play with it to a certain extent. But, um, you know, there's a reason that's such a powerful mm. narrative and my book does conform to that. And mm. I felt very much that I wanted this to be a, a plot-driven mm. book. So, yeah. Mm. It's you set yourself a really tricky task <laughs> in the beginning. It is a plot-driven book and yeah. you do really want to find out what happens <laughs> and you care about the characters. And as much as anything, you're completely immersed in the music of the language. Um, but at the beginning... And I, I mm. like that you ask a little bit of your reader. Mm. They have mm. to be patient with you just while you establish the coordinates of this world. Yes. But the tricky task you set yourself is that your main character doesn't have memory. Yeah. So you can't <laughs> actually give us his background yeah. because he's the narrator. It was a massive handicap. And I sort of, because I said, you know, I got the, I heard the voice and I was so sort of seduced by this voice and I was like, you know, it's this cataclysm, boom, out of the blue. And I was like, you know, I've got, I sort of got to ride this. And I, and I did and I was very conscious of, you know, really channeling it for as mm. long as I could and as long as it had energy for me. And it was only sort of at a later point when I thought, okay, I can't, you know, I can't dictate this novel. That's mm. not going to happen. It's not going to all come from this sort of on high, transcendent mm. kind of burst of inspiration. There's going to be a huge amount of work and craft and um, decision making. I just want to stop you there. Mm. That was just a really key moment. It's never about inspiration on high. It's no. just about slogging out on the craft level. If you're level. lucky, I think yeah. you get a moment that is so radiant that it it propels you throughout, mm. and that was sort of what this book felt like for me. If I hadn't had that moment of um, being sideswiped, I don't know if I would have had the energy to continue on with it. But, you know, very quickly, that first energetic boost burst, mm. you know, you, you reach the end of it. Half-life is, is short, and um, you've got to go back to, you know, the verities of, of actual craft and, and working out how to construct a, a novel that somebody can read and enter into and understand. And I very quickly realised I'd set myself this really difficult task, which, as you say, you, it's, it's hard to write with a first-person protagonist who can't remember what's going on. And not only because you, it's very hard to reveal what the plot is, but it's also incredibly hard to characterise because, you know, mm. memory is one of our key tools of characterisation. Exactly. You know, like, oh, yeah. and then I was walking along, no, I, I thought back to the time when, mm. you know, my mum said this to me and I reacted in that way, and then you go, oh, that's the kind of person it mm. is. That's and right. I, I couldn't do that. Um, and, you know, there's also a terrible risk that you're going to bore the reader to tears or that, you know, there's not going mm. to be enough. Well, so because then the reader thinks, I can't work out what's going yeah. on. I don't know how to navigate. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not no, saying... No, I, I think that's I think that was entirely it. what people <laughs> have felt. Um, well, this is to say, if you feel this in the beginning of this book, persevere because it's totally worth it. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> but, you know, in lots of ways, it was a reflection of my experience as a writer as yeah. well. Because I was Simon and I was trying to work out how this world worked mm. and how to make it work for a reader and I, his sort of ignorance was mine his blindness was mine and I felt very much like I was in a tunnel you know I could see maybe mm. a foot ahead of me and the rest was darkness which is the way um, Margaret Atwood describes making a novel well, is, you, is, go, you is, go into a darkened yeah. room and you can only feel the furniture oh does he oh, okay yeah. yeah that's brilliant because um, that that sort of analogy is mm. just so very much you know you're creating a structure at the same time as you're working mm. out what the structure is. And, you know, writing a second novel, which doesn't really have terribly many parallels with that mm. origin story with the chimes, still feels like that. So, yeah. um, but, I mean, writing is about problem solving. Well, exactly. I was going to say, you know, I think that first kind of spark of the novel for me was two seemingly, you know, opposed and difficult ideas. Can they go together? And there was that, the spark was the difficulty, you know, 
because as soon as you say, oh no, that can't work, your brain is firing little, you know, synopses that, uh, mm. synapses that say, you know, oh, but maybe, you know, oh, mm. but that could happen, or if we did this, then, and as soon as those hooks are in, you're invested in the world, mm. and I think, for me, as a writer who'd written poetry and had seen fiction as other and mm. um, mm. too, too sort of remote, removed, understanding writing a novel and constructing the world of a novel as a series of problems was actually entirely liberating. Mm. And even remembering that now as I write my second novel, you don't, you know, because it's a vast, vast world of freedom. And in it, you've got to, you know, you've got to establish everything. You know, you've mm. got to establish gravity. You've got to establish, you And know, especially if you're inventing a new language environment. in a new world. Yeah, yeah you, and not, not to mention people. So if you start making decisions and you're seeing it as a sort of almost like a decision tree, then obviously there's a huge amount that has to happen. It can't make a novel solely out of yes and no decisions, but it, it gives you a kind of a smaller se sections to work mm. on. It restricts that world. And so, in fact, having a, no a narrator who can't remember mm. made me, you know, it made it smaller for me mm. and that made it easier in some way. You had to work within I that parameter. I had to work within that constraint. And mm. the first person voice and, and things like I didn't let myself, you know, there's very few um, adverbs mm. in, in the traditional mm. LY mm -hmm. adverb mm. um, usage because it seemed sort of somehow to contravene the present tense. Mm. And so there are, there are some rules in that book which I set myself in terms of vocab mm. and in terms of um, uh, syntactical structure mm. that actually, that, that's where my style came from, that's where the voice mm. came from. Something you do, which is a consequence of um, music being the defining um, feature of the language and mm. the story, you commit what I think is the most artful thing, <laughs> synesthesia. Um, just to explain for those of you who don't know it, synesthesia, which is really hard to say, yeah, is yeah. when the senses become fused and crossed. So you may hear, you, you may taste a feeling, um, you may see a sound, mm. and your characters do that quite, quite often. Which yes. Is, so, so you've actually been liberated to do something new and interesting in your book as a consequence of your oh, um, problems. You. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a nice way to think about it. Um, I think uh, I felt, oh, sorry. No, go on. Yep. Um, well, it felt very much as if, you know, this world is one of restriction and, and, and um, limitation, and, but without the ability to kind of see, um, to plot a path ahead, which is, you know, planning into a future relies on your ability to understand a past, um, and to form abstract kind of um, concepts as one goes along experience is also reliant on the mm. past. So if they're in a world which is very much this contemporary moment, this present moment, it seemed to me that in your, your senses would heighten, heighten yeah. you know, and you'd have to combine them in order to get a more, mm. more depth and more intricacy in terms of the vision. But also, it seems to me exactly the right thing for a novel about being a, an adolescent, because your yeah. senses are heightened anyway. Yeah, I think you, so, yeah. You do experience the world in an explosive and um, heated way. Yeah, yeah. way. yeah, totally. I'm terribly, I want to ask more questions, yep. but I'm mindful that you may have some questions for Anna. If you, if you do, is there someone with a mic? Um, Maybe not in this session. If you do have a question, can you just raise your hand? Here's one up here. And can you just speak yeah, slowly we can and loudly? Yes, I can. I was just wondering what your process was in writing on the Sure. Um, well, when I first started, it was quite clandestine and I was um, sort of doing other things. So it would be I'd grab a day and I'd go to the library and I'd sort of write undercover. Then um, I sort of had the first third of the book and my daughter was born and so then writing became mostly evenings. Um, and it's only since she went to childcare that I've really developed more of a daily routine, which is now, um, you know, write, I, I always write longhand. So sort of spend the, as much of the morning as possible just generating words. Um, typically use the afternoon to kind of type up onto my computer and edit as I go. And I think the more you get immersed in the world of a novel, the more it starts kind of pressing in on your every moment, and so you know, start reading it at all opportunities, and you sort of entering in that dream state. So it sort of it does is a bit of flex there, yeah. And happily, you're married to a novelist, so he understands. Yeah, he yeah. understands. Yeah, happily, and you know, obviously, you know, with, with some, well. <laughs> some difficulty. No, very, very yeah. happily married, but you know, there's yes. the sense of um, two writers is great because you understand each other's mm. foibles and the difficulties, but you know, there's obvious drawbacks mm. in the sense that you're both always going to be on like some kind of borderline income. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any more questions over here? Yes. Hi. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's really true. And it was really hard. It was like the hardest time of my life because I'd really, um, you know, I'd grown up playing the violin and had been like right through my teenage years. It was sort of what I did. And it was so much where all of my experiences went. You know, I sort of really felt like it was this input output thing where everything I experienced, everything I thought and felt had to in some way trans be transmuted and then it would come out in, in music. And just that, that equation was just, that's just my, was my understanding of the world. So I never really kind of thought about it until it kind of ruptured and, and it felt like a vacuum basically. I really felt um, lost and I felt like I didn't know how, you know, what to do with my experiences or my thoughts. And, and who you were? And who I was, utterly, my identity. Yeah, I was very, I felt I was suddenly rendered, I felt like I had like a, a shell ripped off or kind of a series of layers of skin kind of taken off. Um, so I think with, with, the, with writing, I'd always been writing up until that point, but there was a period at which I actually thought, okay, I want to sort of almost translate these things through writing, kind of get those, harness those kind of connections and, and f find another application in writing. And I think that's what I want to do with poetry and um, very much my first book was part of that process. Yeah. Where music is just at the centre of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very autobiographical, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of embarrassingly. But, oh, it's um, beautiful. But yeah, they are, they're very different. I think I'm still in some ways searching for the mechanism that playing music allowed me, because I think there's something about the physicality of practising an instrument that, you know, it's very, it's, it's almost meditative or yogic. You know, you're kind of in the moment, yet your brain is doing a series of different other physical and kind of mental things. And I just remember just feeling afterwards like, I can do, you know, it just felt transcendent, you know, it's... Um, hey, maybe you could begin to sing your stories. <laughs> I don't think anyone who's heard me singing would probably <laughs> encourage that. We have time for one more question. Hello. Um, do you think there's any theme throughout the novel that only musicians share, and how does being a musician and an artist work together in your novel? That's a good question. It is, um, yeah. Thematically, I would really hope that, you know, some of the overarching themes um, would apply to maybe all of art or all of kind of the ways in which people are rather than solely this experience of music um, in the sense that I think that sort of all or nothing dichotomy that you know is experienced through music in this book I think that can be accessed in through philosophy I think it can be accessed through you know other forms of art just and even just through thinking um, so hopefully I would hope that there are no themes which are kind of exclu would, would exclude non-musicians um, Possibly in the sense that, you know, I wrote that having, you know, sort of lived music for quite a long time. Not, I mean, I never really thought of myself as t t technically proficient or sort of knowing a huge amount about music. I don't. Um, but, you know, when you take it for granted, maybe some, you know, terms and Italian terms and things like that. So I think if you haven't had any background in music, there might be a few things that you think are prohibitive. But I think, and actually, they're, they're very much minor details of the world which don't, we, don't, you shouldn't need to rely on in order to kind of experience the world, hopefully. I'd just but, like to say yeah. as a reader, um, it, it doesn't interrupt, really, it, it adds, and there's things that where you think, not quite sure what that is, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Mm. And there are very few terms that, I mean, they'll recur, so you hopefully mm. get the sense of what they mean. I'm Thanks. sorry we have to finish, but I want to finish on a note that really represents Anna and <laughs> her words and music. I asked if she would read a poem from The Violinist in Spring. Sure. Um, okay, so this is from the sequence, the title sequence, and it's incredibly autobiographical. <laughs> Obviously with some, you know, transmutation. The Nightmare. Outside the door, there is a stumbling thing that must be flawed, with volleys of notes like blows from an axe handle, a chord like a round from a firing squad. But wait. Here come the cleaning ladies. They bring their buckets, their soaps and mops. And I know that I'll be saved if through the louvered window I can send a ray of sound so sweet it stops them in their tracks. A ray of sound, more synesthesia. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> very um, Anna, of course, will be signing books outside. You can buy them at the bookshop. Um, and um, I, I need to tell you that the next session in this theatre is Jamie Carey and Mer Mallory Ortberg, Life Online. But first of all, please join me in thanking Anna Smale very much. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs>